Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's great to see all of you here this morning. My name is Pastor Jim, and whether you're here or online or watching by video, we are happy that you've joined us in worship today on this Labor Day weekend. So happy Labor Day, a day early, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in in my sermon message, but um, this is a holiday weekend that a lot of people travel normally, or some people do, um, and um, so we're happy that we're able to enjoy uh, time away from work and time celebrating work at this on the same day, right? So anyway, um, Glad you're here. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, there is a training session next Sunday after worship for Kids Rock. And even if you haven't signed up for Kids Rock, uh, our children's um, ministry program, um, and are interested in helping with that in any way, shape, or form, come to that training session and see what it's all about. And those of you who are signed up to help, it's on a rotation basis so that we don't have the same leaders each week. Um, if you are signed up, then please come to that training session uh, after worship. And also, uh, the following week on September 19th is Back to Church Sunday. Hello, guys. I'm so glad you're here. And you brought me eggs. Um, Caleb, you lost my train of thought. Uh, back to church Sunday on the 19th. Um, we are celebrating with thousands of other churches nationwide. This is a national celebration day of back to church. And the, the original idea of it was you should ask a friend, a neighbor, a, a family member to come to church with you on that Sunday and celebrate coming back to church. I don't know if that means after a summer off, we didn't take the summer off, but um, it, it's celebrating the fact that we ought to be together in worship. And the theme this year is hope is here. And I can't think of a more appropriate theme right now than hope because of everything that we experience out there, um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So. Uh, hope is here. Come celebrate with us on the 19th, and um, I hope we have a full house that day. That being said, um, our pandemic response team meets today after worship. And with all the things going on in the world that's that are still changing with regards to COVID, we're going to talk about how to keep all of us safe. We've been discerning and praying about this for some time, and um, so we're probably going to make some difficult decisions after worship today. So worship will not cease to exist, I can assure you that. We will worship in some way, shape, or form going forward, but it may not look exactly the same as it looks today. So pray about that, please and keep all of the folks on that team in your prayers uh, for God's wisdom and God's um, love during the, these difficult times. So let's prepare our hearts and minds this day for worship. Good morning. <coughs> We are, <clears throat> excuse me, we are called to be people of faith in the midst of this world. And so we mix our worship and our work and our faith and our life. We gather these as people who live in the world, and yet we gather as people, <clears throat> excuse me, who have been called to see the world from a different viewpoint. Please pray with me for God to open our hearts and minds in our worship time. God, you have called us together to be part of this body of Christ. We have you have challenged us to consider questions of priority 
as we engage with the world. In this time together, open our hearts and our minds and our eyes, allowing us to see deeper. Help us to live in the world while still offering a challenge to the ways of the world. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Please join me and stand, if you are able, to sing our opening hymn, Christ for the World We Sing. This greeting of each other that we call the passing of Christ's peace is a short time for every one of us to respond to each other and to God's greeting us here in worship. Please extend the peace of Jesus Christ to each other by either waving, placing your hand upon your heart, or the peace sign to everyone around you. On this Labor Day Sunday, let us lift up all people who labor either for pay or as volunteers, in jobs or at school, at home or in the workplace, here at home and all around the world. Take a few moments of silence to pray to God, remembering all of his laborers, and then to confess your own failures to labor in his name. Let's pray silently. Our God is a good God of grace and transformation. When we ask God, when we ask, God gives us the courage and the strength to live out our faith in the workplace and then the marketplace, as well as in the sanctuary. Know that in, by, and through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now it's the children's message with Pastor Carrie. Mm -hmm. 
I'm so short, I can't see you all. Good morning. Because <laughs> with COVID, I'm going to be up here. Normally, I'd like to be down there with y'all, but just to be a little bit safer, I'll stand on my tippy toes. I can see some of you. But we're going to talk about James this morning in the Bible. And James wrote a letter, and we're going to start with chapter 2 of his letter. And it says, and I'm using the, the message, so it's going to be a little bit different in the Pew Bibles. All right. So it'll be a little bit different than your Pew, Pew Bibles from the version message. But it starts off, my dear friends, don't let public opinion influence how you live out your glorious Christ or originated faith. If a man enters your church wearing an expensive suit and a street person wearing rags comes right after him, you say to the man in the suit, sit here, this is the best seat of the house. So, now this letter was written thousands and thousands of years ago. Well, a couple thousand, roughly. So, this doesn't happen today, does it? What do we think? Thumbs up, thumbs down? I can see a couple of you. <laughs> yeah, possibly. And when I searched for homeless pastor, there are all kinds of homeless pastors that have done experiments with this, but I found one that um, seemed authentic, what he did. And his name is um, Pastor James McDonald. And he's from a mega church, so they have multiple ch church locations. He dressed up as a homeless person, much like, that's my husband Brian back there. He, he wore you know, a cap and, a, and disguised himself in a beard and a flannel shirt. And he, there, there's actually a video of this, which is kind of kind of in, really interesting to watch. So if you have time to search for the the viral um, video that goes with this. He pushes up the shopping cart with all his belongings as he's dressed in his homeless attire, and he camps out in front of the church. Basically, he did this as a test to see what will the people do. So in the video shows people walking past, past him, and pretty much kind of like he had the worst case of COVID you could possibly imagine. They just walked past him, didn't say a word to him. That's how the video begins. But then things, things do, he um, comes up to the, um, the pulpit to do his sermon because he is the pastor and he takes off his outfit. I'm going to have Brian come on back up and socially distance, um, I guess, he, wherever he wants it. I'm good. <laughs> so we'll get back to what happens when his sermon because I want to go back to James. And James says, listen, dear friends, isn't it clear by now that God operates quite differently? What do we think about that? That's a question. Does, does God operate quite differently? Yeah, I see some nodding heads. Yeah. Yeah, so in Pastor McDonald's sermon that he gave, he says, I want to find the quote that I really like that he did. He said a couple of quotes that were really... Good. One of his quotes is, if we're going to love like our Father in heaven loves, we don't get to play favorites. So back to James a little bit. James tells us God operates quite differently. God chose the worlds down and out as the kingdom's first citizens with full rights and privileges. This kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God. So who's the kingdom promised to? Anyone. That loves God. And Pastor McDonald, he showed more of his, um, th his video, because it first started off with everyone walking past, but he asked a congregation, he, he explained to them why he dressed up as a homeless person, then he asked them, how do you think we did? And the congregation stood there kind of, they didn't really know the answer, and he goes, awesome. Then they showed the rest of the video where People went up to him and offered him coffee. They offered him money. They offered him prayer, prayed with him. They offered him, please come in the church with us. So that's a, I like, like to think as Christians, that's a really happy 
end of to that story of his test of the, his um, parish, his congregation. And I like to think that we would react that way too. And to just kind of finish out a little bit with James, a little bit of his letter, jumping to verse 8, it says, You will do well when you complete the royal role of scriptures. Love others as you love yourself. Sounds kind of easy, but it's not always easy, is it? Yeah, I, have, I see some perplexed looks on my face from the kids I can see. But that is the role that we're given. So every day, that's, that's what, we can, what we do, is to, to love others as we would like to be loved. So basically, treat others like, like you would want to be treated. So let me end there with James in his letter. And let us end with prayer. So dear God, thank you for this letter of James in the Bible that reminds us that the kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God, whether they're in an exquisite suit or whether they're dressed in flannel. And however, however we come to God and love God, we are promised the kingdom. God loves each and every one of us, and we are to love others as we love ourselves. Amen. Thank you, kids. Please let us pray. Compassionate God, all creation delights in your radiant presence of your word. May the authority of your spirit bring understanding into our confused minds and truth into our troubled hearts, that we may praise and serve Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand, if you're able, to sing our sermon hymn. <laughs> Testament reading for today is Proverbs 22, 1 through 2. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all.
So Labor Day is tomorrow, and one of the things that I think about when I think about my own work experiences is my very first official job as a teenager. You see, I worked for the maintenance department of a nursing home. And it was my summer job responsibilities to go into all the residents' rooms, remove the air conditioner units, transport them to the back of the building outside, and clean them, spray them off with a sprayer and a hose. That was my primary responsibility. Well, this whole process seemed like hard physical labor to a teenager who just wanted to sit around in the summer and do nothing, frankly. I can remember the manager, though, of that maintenance department checking on me regularly, sometimes hourly. And he would always ask the same question of me. Are you working hard or are you hardly working? And you see, he did not trust his observation that I was sweating and that I was busy doing something and, um, and doing things enough to really believe that I was working hard. He didn't trust his sight, right? So he had to ask that question, kind of jokingly, but he asked the question and he checked on me often. And so maybe it was that he had hired too many teenagers that just worked hard when he was around and then loafed the rest of the time. It could be, it could be that. So in light of our celebration tomorrow of being laborers in God's kingdom, let's be honest about appearances. Let's be honest about not just looking like we're working hard, but actually working hard for God's kingdom. Because God's always around. Our perceptions, you see, are not always real. What we see, what that manager saw, was not, he didn't trust. Because we form our perceptions from our five senses, usually first. You know, what we see, hear, taste, smell, touch. We can't always trust that completely. So, <clears throat> if you've ever read much of James, the book of James, be aware that it's direct and it's hard-hitting and it's convicting. So let's read together this passage from James chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, because the good things about the letter of James is that it shows an early church pastor diagnosing, confronting, and dealing with misperceptions, misbeliefs, and misbehavior in the congregation that he was serving. So, let's read together verses 1 to 10, which teaches us that showing partiality or favoritism based on our perceptions is actually a sin, and spells out how we can more easily fall into that temptation and avoid falling into that temptation. So listen to God's word. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law, law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. 
For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. May God bless our hearing of his word this day. All praise, honor, and glory go to him. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Eugene Peterson introduces the letter of James this way. When Christian believers gather in churches, everything that can go wrong sooner or later does. Outsiders, on observing this, conclude that there is nothing to this religion business except, perhaps, business, and dishonest business at that. He goes on to explain that insiders see it differently. You see, those people outside the church, any church, are often relying only on their perceptions and not the reality. James points out that even those inside the church can be tempted to rely on only on perceptions and living out their faith. He is speaking out against partiality and favoritism specifically. And you may think these two words are referring only to discriminating against certain people because of their wealth. However, these words apply to much bigger and much deeper challenges than just wealth. In fact, partiality and favoritism really means to favor some people over others or pay special attention to, some, to a person because of their wealth, because of their social standing, because of their looks, their clothing, their popularity, and all other things like that. In reality, this can apply to anything that forms our perceptions, mistakenly. But note that this charge is directed and given to believers in Jesus Christ. It points the charge to brothers and sisters, to those who have faith in our Lord. James is telling us that all of the people on earth the very people who should not show person show partiality of any kind are those believers us we should know better the reason is clearly stated in verse 1 listen to verse 1 from the message and i'm not sure but i i think maybe carrie read this my dear friends don't let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious Christ-originated faith. This guide for our lives that he's giving us comes directly from Jesus, the originator of our faith, the perfecter of our faith. That is the most important reason to live that way. This may sound like a very basic principle that we all know, but everyone stands on equal ground before the Lord Jesus Christ. Wealth, status, social standing, clothing, looks, position, nothing, none of those things matters except all men and women coming to Jesus and worshiping Jesus. We all come to him on an equal footing in that respect. No one is higher or more acceptable than anyone else. So here is why these perceptions of ours tempt us and draw us into that deception. We live in this world where we rely on our perceptions a lot, regularly and constantly. How many of you and I want, to show if, uh, I want a show of hands. How many of you bought potato chips from a vending machine? Almost everybody in the room. Oh, come on, Mike. <laughs> Have you bought something else from a vending machine? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> 
could be Fritos, corn chips, could be Doritos, or any kind of snack food that comes packaged in a vending machine. Okay? You see, this is just one easy, common example of deception that is often something that looks good on the outside and makes great promises, but on the inside you find it is two-thirds empty. Right? Am I right? There is, there is really not much to it, no, at least not as much as you thought, right, by the size of the bag. We've all bought into this kind of empty deception. You've put money into a machine and pushed a button for a bag of potato chips or whatever else Mike got, and when the bag comes out, you thought it was going to be full of chips until you opened it, right? It turns out to be mainly full of air and contains only a few chips. If we had examined the bag closely before making the purchase, by going like this, you would have discovered that. We would have seen it as an empty deception. This kind of reliance on our perceptions is regular and often. It happens a lot. And it filters right into our faith lives from the rest of our lives. And it, it affects how we live, how we view people, products, places, circumstances. It affects it all. The Colossians are a perfect example of believers who were in danger of buying into an empty deception. The Apostle Paul warned them that they were being presented with religious philosophies and ideas and humanly imposed things that looked good on the surface, but when examined on the inside, they were found to be shallow and empty of truth. Let's make this even more relatable and simple. Potato chips is pretty relatable and simple, but we'll make it even more relatable. Whenever you or I look at a person we do not know, what kind of first opinion or perceptions form the fastest? Right? Think about that. When you look at a stranger, what do you notice first? And what goes through your mind? Right? How do we form those perceptions? There was a middle-aged couple who lived in rural area of Tennessee who received a registered letter from the Internal Revenue Service, a big manila envelope. Stamped on the outside of this manila envelope were large letters and that said, final notice in bold print. Praise the Lord, said the wife to her husband. This is the last time the government is going to badger us about our overdue taxes. <laughs> Perception is not always reality. When we read the book of James, just when we thought that James was going to stop making us squirm in our seats. He forces us to tackle the tough tasks of faith and works. Partiality and favoritism. Racism and classism in the body of Christ. He attacks all of those things. Because these are very real challenges for every one of us as followers of Christ. In this passage, James gives us a down-to-earth illustration. And his point is well taken that we must leave all favoritism and status-seeking not only outside in the parking lot on Sunday mornings, but, when, but outside of our daily lives, every day. The reason is simple. The ground is level at the foot of the cross for everyone in this room and out there. Jesus' ministry touches everyone. Just like in scripture, the blind beggar, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, Zacchaeus, the rich young ruler, the thief on the cross. His ministry was for and to every person. And so must our ministry and treatment of every person be like that. 
James is communicating an Old Testament truth. Don't judge by outward appearances. God looks inward before he looks outward. Intellectually, we all know that labels can be unhealthy and very deceptive. We often say, don't judge a book by its cover. We say that, but then we don't live it. However, we're constantly tempted to use those labels to make judgments about other people. There's a true story about Miami Dolphins football coach Don Shula. Those of you who are football fans know who he is. Um, and he was taking his wife on vacation to a small seaside town in, my, in Maine. This was back whenever the Dolphins had been winning consistently championships. He had heard it was a quiet place where they could relax without anyone paying attention to them. That's where he wanted to be. It seemed wherever he went those days, in those days, people would always say, there's a great coach, or run up and ask for an autograph. It was raining when they arrived, so they decided to take in a movie. When they entered the small theater, the lights were on and the show hadn't started yet. To their surprise, a scattered handful of people gave them a round of applause just as they sat down in their seats. Secretly pleased, Shula whispers to his wife, I guess there isn't anywhere I'm not known. You're known and love the world over, she sarcastically says to him. And a man with a friendly, a friendly smile comes over to them and shook hands with Don Shula. And he said, I'm really surprised you know me here, Shula remarks to him. Should I know you, the man replied. We're just happy to see you folks. You see, the manager came over the loudspeaker and said we wouldn't start the film until two more people come in. <laughs> this brought Don Shula back down to reality quickly. Friends, here's the reality of our faith in Jesus Christ. In our Christian faith lives, we all lean on the grace of God. Every one of us. We're all beggars, telling other beggars where we found the bread of life. No one of us is first in line or last in line for that bread because we're all equal in line. God's word tells us how mortals look upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon our hearts. We who are followers of Christ must learn to see people just as Christ sees them. Christ died for us all and lives in us all. And Christ does not play favorites at all. The cross is all the fame, fortune, and favored status you or I will ever need. I want to close this morning by reviewing verses 8 to 10 because in James, because these words of James point us to how important this really should be for our daily lives. Listen once more to these verses. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism in any way, your sin, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whenever, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. We see just how important this law is by, by it being called the great royal law, according to scripture. And you and I can easily figure out that it's royal for at least three reasons and probably many more. It's the royal law of God's kingdom. It was given by God himself. It's the great law that includes all the other laws, number two. And number three, it's the very commandment that leads to eternal life. The point is this, believers are to love people and not show partiality or discrimination against some for any reason, in any ways. We need to look at people with God's eyes, 
and see them as his creation. We are to receive people, actually reach out to people through our speech, through our behavior, no matter who they are or where they are. God is going to judge us on the basis of how we have loved and reached out to his people. And it's regardless of who they are, where we find them, where we encounter them, or what we think about them. Friends, here's the bonus for us. This will not be easy. It doesn't sound like a bonus. But it is a bonus because, because it's not easy, and God knows it's not easy. God chooses to walk with us in all of those circumstances. And he strengthens, he prepares, and he pushes us to live that way in all of those circumstances. In the new creation given to us by Jesus, it is our joy and our duty to build a community where love, peace, justice, and kindness rule every day. May we always see the reality of God giving us the grace to make that so in spite of our perceptions. Amen. Let's all stand, if you're able, to state what we believe with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God Almighty, God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. In our prayer time today, we want to um, lift up all of those joys and concerns on your hearts and minds, but I want to mention just a couple first. Um, I got a call from Roma Park yesterday, and her daughter, Karen, passed away, suddenly. Karen, I think, was her eldest, her oldest daughter, and um, it's always difficult when parents experience the death of children um, before their own. It's, it's, it's hard, I've heard people say it's hard to outlive your children. Um, so we want to lift up the Park family, uh, Karen's family, all of the Park family um, and friends and for God's peace and God's strength during this time. They don't know any arrangements yet, and as soon as we receive the, those, we will pass those along probably by email to everyone. I also want to lift up um, Jan Redshaw's son-in-law, Bill Thomas, has been living with Alzheimer's for uh, several years, and um, he is now um, declined to a point where, he, is he on hospice? Did you tell me that? Yeah, he's on hospice care. So Bill Thomas um, and the whole family remains in our prayers. Um, his wife, Dawn, um, for God's strength and God's peace during this time. Is there anything else? Shelley. Hmm. 
Thank you, Shelley. We can lift up uh, the Campbell family and everyone, all their friends and, and family on their loss. Emerson. Your team won, what was the last part? Ah, thank you. Anna Mary. Yeah, the Park family has had a, an extraordinarily difficult year. Gary? Yeah, and one note, uh, there's an article from the Butler Eagle that was on the front page, is on that back bulletin board with his picture uh, being welcomed by his fellow officers. So that's an answer to prayers, lots of prayers. Was that it? Uh, okay. I thought you said two different. Ed. Yes, thank you, Ed, for lifting that up every week. <laughs> they, they need our constant prayers. Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God of our lives, <clears throat> we thank you for being here with us today. We thank you for your presence each day and how you guide us and you lead us and you comfort us and you strengthen us. So Lord God, help us to recognize your presence, help us to draw on that presence, help us to feel you taking us by the hand each day. No matter what challenges we face, no matter what difficulties we encounter, no matter what unknown things happen to us suddenly, you are there. And Lord God, today we lift up in prayer um, because you have promised us that whenever we are gathered in prayer, whenever we pray to you, whenever we speak to you, that you will not only hear us, but you'll listen to us and provide answers to us and uh, provide for our needs in your way and on our time, in your time. Um, Lord God, we lift up the family of Grace Campbell and ask your blessing upon them uh, in this time. Give them your peace, give them your reassurance, and help them to live their lives acknowledging and remembering grace. Lord God, um, we thank you for sports competitions. Uh, whenever we win, it's exciting, 
and we thank you for the gift of being able to participate. Uh, we lift up the family, uh, the Park family, during this time and ask your blessing upon all of them on the passing of Karen. Give them peace in knowing that Karen is in your hands and help Roma and all of the family to gather together uh, for each other in remembering Karen and celebrating Karen's life and help them to move on from there uh, with your strength and your peace. Lord God, we thank you for also for um, um, being with them on the loss of Dick Thomas and um, you know all the losses they've experienced this year, you have been with them. Roma said those words to me herself that she has felt your presence even though experiencing all the, of the losses. Lord God, we thank you for Officer Michael and bringing him back to health and recovery and to be welcomed by his friends, family, and, and fellow officers. Um, Lord God, we lift up the people of Afghanistan and ask your blessing upon them as they strive to leave or strive just to live safely. Be with them, strengthen them, surround them with your loving care. Lord God, you, um, you are constant in our lives. Help us to see that. Help us to recognize that the way we perceive people and places and circumstances are not always reality in your eyes. Help us to be strengthened and have the strength of faith to spread the good news of the gospel even in times of loss, even in times of challenge, even in times that are changing around us. Give us the ability to, um, to have your constant faith, to have your constant love, to have your constant hope. We ask and we pray all of these things, both spoken and unspoken prayers in the strong name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who came and lived and died and was raised for us as he taught us to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on our own as individuals, what we have to give doesn't amount to much individually in the light of all that God has given to us. In the face of so much need, though, we, we may feel this way. But put our gifts together as a congregation and as the body of Christ. And what we offer God here in love becomes much more and much stronger, not simply added together, but somehow multiplied in its usefulness in God's hands. Thank you for your continued generosity and commitment to giving to this body of Christ in all of our ministries and all of our missions. And thank you for giving and commitment of faith toward God and his work. Given by mail, given in person here, given online, however it happens, it's a blessing and God will bless you as a giver. And you are blessed to be a blessing to others. So let's pray for God's blessing of our gifts. Lord God, we ask you to bless all of our gifts and with the addition of your blessing, multiply them just as you did with the loaves and fishes for Jesus. And may there be enough for all so that all may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today and always. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join me in singing. They'll know we are Christians.
Now to him who can do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to the work of the Holy Spirit within us, be all glory in the church and in his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So go with the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship, guidance, and strength of the Holy Spirit, today and every day. Amen.